Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Your Best Game Ever. Uh, we are uh, embarking upon part two of our Advanced GMing Techniques series. Um, there, it turns out there's a lot to talk about. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we are so, so excited to uh, dig into this with you. So I'm Darcy Ross, and I'm here with Monty Cook, and we are diving into concepts from your best game ever, which is now out, and you can go get at your friendly local gaming store or at yourbestgameever.com. Uh, there is tons in here for new GMs, new players, experienced GMs, experienced players. But what we're focusing on today is part two of advanced GMing. So please, uh, what, please join us as we talk about how to be a really dynamic GM. So we, we spent part one sort of getting set up, uh, talking about how to set yourself up for greatness um, as you got, get players together for a campaign, as you prepare you know, sharing GMing duties, possibly with a co-GM, um, you know, sort of all the, the setup and early campaign stuff. But when you're in a given session or a given campaign, let's talk about techniques that you can use to sort of get the kind of gaming experience that you want at your table. So Monty, where, where should we start? Well, you know, this is, this is one of my sort of favorite, favorite things to talk about because so much of it relies on uh, not just storytelling, not just adventure creation or whatever, but actually the GM's relationship with the players. Mm. And, 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 and really what it comes down to is, is evoking a, an actual mood, real emotion, right? Which is kind of, it's why we tell stories, right? Is, 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 is to talk about things like emotion and, and, you know, a lot of times if it's a, you know, combat heavy dungeon exploration game, that emotion is just, you know, woohoo, we beat more orcs or, or whatever. Right. But that's valid. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Um, but, you know, let's talk more about like, you know, things like, a, you know, if you're trying to play a horror game or you're trying to, you know, have some romance in your game or, uh, you know, evoking sort of other emotions, beyond you know who aren't we more powerful than we were last fight um and and you know the thing that i think about here is is you know it's all sort of i'm gonna i'm gonna use a phrase here uh, it's sort of above the table yeah. right it's not it's not in anybody's character sheet right or whatever it's it's kind of what's going on in the room where we're playing mm -hmm. right and and a lot of this is is stuff that we maybe have all tried before, but but we should we should you know kind of cover the bases, right? And so like controlling the lighting, right? Yeah. If you are if you're you know making something, you know if they're exploring a deep dark dungeon or the haunted house or whatever, dim the lights a little bit. Um, you know there are accessibility issues here. We want to make sure that everyone can see their character sheet right. and whatnot. But within those, whatever limitations that you and your players ha might have, mm -hmm. um, you know, play around with stuff like that. You know, um, music is another great one that yes. that's, that's a mood, right? That, you know, just kind of, you know, if you're playing D&D &D and you're, you know, playing the Gladiator soundtrack or the mm -hmm. Conan soundtrack or whatever, yeah. right? There's just something about that that is going... It elevates it. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, what other kinds of things um, have you done or have you seen done that kind of affect the environment around us? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I really, I'm very not crafty. I wish I was. <laughs> I really am not, but I, I really key off of like objects and props. I get a lot out when, when they're sort of um, handouts or maps or tokens that are sort of in-game tokens, right? And so one thing I did uh, for a the first campaign I ran was um, I told every player that if they brought a prop that was like representative of something that their character would have, like they'd get an extra mechanical bonus, right? Just some little incentive to, to bring something. And I and uh, so people brought weird paper claws that they put on their fingertips. And, uh, you know, I, for, for, for my side of it, I had a lot of um, strange stones and tokens that were these sort of like uh, portal key type things that, um, that I think, you know, just gave this, this sense of like weird and tactility that we could all kind of have in the center of the table. 
And uh, so props go a long way for me. And like, you know, do you like, if you're in a space game, do you have a shiny little tablet like showing the beautiful space cosmos in the middle of the room and that's your map? Or is it, you know, this sort of uh, crumpled up blood stained map for your horror game, right? Like the nature of those physical objects can really set a mood. And, you know, when it comes to, to music, to maybe even like lighting a candle, to light change, I, as a GM, I think I'm both trying to set the mood uh, with those that those atmospheric effects, both for the players and um, you know for the other players as well as for myself. I can just tell that you know I unconsciously respond to those cues, um, and it makes my GMing better and feed more into this atmosphere that I want. So it's both self hacking and sort of hacking the space around the other players. I um I'm gonna out myself a little bit here um as as being someone who doesn't mind occasionally kind of manipulating my players a little bit subconsciously. Here's my favorite one. <laughs> uh, there there are lots of little tricks like this, but here's my favorite one. Okay. Playing a horror game. Um, seat the players in such a way, if you, if you can, right? It, you, everyone has different amounts of control over the environment, right? But it, it, see, see the players so that their backs are to an open door or a window, uh, which is unnerving enough, mm -hmm. right? But then if throughout the course of the game, if you just every once in a while just kind of glance, like, like you heard a weird noise, uh like behind them through that open door or whatever, just, I mean, don't be overt about it because then, right. you know, they're going to, they're, the reaction is going to be too big. What you want is people just kind of sitting there and listening to your description or, or, you know, talking to the NPC or whatever, but still kind of thinking, um, you know, just that, that slight bit of kind of unnerved mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, that's the kind of thing that uh, I, I really like to do. Um, and I think it's, it's a little bit of social manipulation, um, but, but if you can do it, it, it works really well and it, and it's kind of fun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are, there are sort of more, uh, um, kind of overt things you can do. Like, like I, uh, I ran a, uh, long running horror game and, uh, <laughs> the players we're always sitting at the same seats around mm -hmm. the table, right? And so I asked him, you know, hey, I noticed you guys are always sitting in the same seats. Um, you know, wh why, do you, why do you do that? And, and someone just said, oh, you know, it's comfortable. And so from then on, I never let them sit in the same seat week after week ever again, oh, right? Because yeah. I, you know, I didn't want them to, I mean, you know, within reason, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't want them to feel comfortable, right? They're supposed to feel a little on edge and things, you know, weren't, aren't exactly what they were expecting or aren't what they were like last week or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I, I think this, you know, if, if I was going to play a game that's uh, pretty intimate and maybe has some romance elements, I would find that pretty hard to do if we are all really far away from each other in the room, right? If we're all like, right. you know, you're on this couch way over there, there's something really different from, you know, the one time that I had a really good, like, romance character arc, um, it, we were all gathered really tightly around this, like, little coffee table where we've got all these, like, hodgepodge grad student cushy couches and, and little egg crate chair things, and, uh, but we're all, like, leaning over you know, there's this intimacy because we're all so physically, you know, much closer. Um, I think I would have had a really much harder time if, if we were physically farther away um, role-playing that. So I think space, like the spatial orientation can, can really matter. That is a really, really good point. Um, I took that too far once. Ooh. Uh, and <laughs> that is, uh, I, this is a little bit of a different situation, but mm -hmm. um, I, uh, uh you know, we were playing Dungeons and Dragons. There was a character who was always casting invisibility on themselves. And of course, I would always forget, right? I would always forget that, oh, the NPCs aren't supposed to be able to see him, right? So <laughs> one session I had, I he cast invisibility and I had him sit under the table. Oh my right? gosh. So that he was just this sort of disembodied voice that would, but uh, that was going too far, that right? That is so fun though. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was right? as a one-time thing or if the player, you know, but anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, 
you know, but you mentioned props yes. and I love props. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard in certain genres, it's harder to do props mm. than in others. Like modern day games, it's so easy. Um, and, and, and one, like, like one of my favorite things I used to be able, that I used to be able to do when I ran a, um, a modern game was I would take like real world things. Mm -hmm. Like if the players were gonna find a written clue, I would, yeah, I would take some flyer that someone was handing out on the street or, you know, whatever. And I would put that clue on that thing and then, and then give it two meanings, right? Mm -hmm. Like the clue is a is a clue, but the fact of what it's on, you know, if it's got an address on it or whatever, maybe yeah. that address is important, right? Or, or you know, like lots of times if you go to bars or clubs or restaurants, right, they'll have matchbooks, mm -hmm. right? Writing something in a matchbook, but then it's also got the name of the restaurant on it, right? Well, maybe, you know, they can go to that restaurant and, uh, you know, that's, that's significant and they can ask the people there or something. Mm -hmm. That's really, really fun. Um, Quick, quick gaming nerd story. Um, I uh, in this in this uh, Call of Cthulhu game that I was running, Modern Day. Um, I was making very, very heavy use of of props, and you know, I would print things out from weird websites, and it was a very like not horror, but also heavy conspiracy game. Oh yeah. So there was lots of weird rambling notes about the Illuminati and the Freemasons and all this stuff, right? Just pages and pages of stuff. and uh, my friend Bruce Cordell was the guy who was responsible for keeping all of the group's pr uh, props mm. all of their handouts and everything that they had to keep and so he kept them all in this old battered briefcase which in and of itself was kind of a oh, prop and, right yeah and one day um uh after a game his car got broken into and someone stole that briefcase Right. Oh and that's the God. only thing that they stole. And that's the only thing that was in that briefcase was all these crazy ramblings about, you know, the end of the world and, oh my all, God. This and all this stuff. So I have, I, I, I sort of really love to think about what that thief thought as he, he or she opened up that briefcase and just found all this craziness and these fake newspaper articles and Okay, uh, you have to start a campaign of like stay alive. That's like the that's the inciting incident, right? Like we, <laughs> you know, I'm a petty thief and I like steal this briefcase and unravel this whole <laughs> world's wide conspiracy. Oh, I love that so much. Oh my gosh. And it all turns out to be true, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, I was thinking about digital gaming too because um, Sean Reynolds is – uh, really clever and I feel like uses a lot of really neat tricks that you can do when you're online gaming too. When you're not in person, you know, there's stuff you can do with little green screens or, or background removers right. and you can, you know, give yourself overlays that make you all look kind of like um, old timey, right? And so whether you're streaming just for yourself, you know, whether you're just doing like a, a Skype call, but you're, you're, you know, sort of streaming to a channel and, and can add all those cool effects that you can all sort of watch um, and experience later. Or there's even stuff you can do on your end, you know, like through, you know, Skype or whatever, there's, um, you can sort of go before you transmit your video to the, uh, to like Zoom or Skype, you can modify it so that uh, you, the, sort, the sort of effects are already built in. Um, and I think that stuff, uh, I, I think like the first time someone used it, I was like, oh, that's very distracting. I'm like, oh, I, you know, I can't handle that. And, but like, I, I think that was just because it was new, right? I think there's some subtle effects that you can do that could really add to the atmosphere. You know, the table story people, um, they're a really cool stream that, uh, streaming group that just started running a Numenera campaign. And, uh, whenever the GM is speaking, through the role of the sort of like AI who's like guiding these players through this world, um, the GM swaps in this like weird scintillating orb and has like a voice modulator and it's like, but it's really seamless and it's quick and like the GM will spend like, like long minutes where the GM is only in that role, right? It's the players talking, the players going out and doing stuff and just the AI occasionally popping in to sort of 
tell the players what level of difficulty a certain task is going to be because it's an AI for this sort of Numenera video game thing. And so that, that GM is like really leaning into that role. And like, that's something that you couldn't do as effectively in person. So I'm, I'm really fascinated by the way that you can set this mood and tone and these visuals and like music, right? Roll 20 lets you pipe in music really smoothly. Everyone gets to hear it. So, um, just like you can in at home, I think there's a lot more options now for online tweaking the atmosphere as well. That is a fantastic point. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And a whole sort of new area that we can start mm-hmm. to infect as gamers. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The viruses that we are. <laughs> Very cool. Um, you know, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit too about something else. This is, this is again, that kind of more on the subtle side, mm-hmm. um, but it is very effective. Um, you know, it, it is is something where you can do things that on a meta game level that are going to convey the mood and the tone and the genre uh, the, of the game you're playing. And so, like, what you know, I I will I will say this many many times throughout these videos, right? But a game is the conversation, right? right. And and uh, everything that the players know about the world is through the conduit of the GM. So uh, think about, you know, if, if everything is a conversation, it's all about words, think about the word choices that you use. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I know not all of us, you know, are fantastic thinking on our feet, you know, coming up with the right word every time. Um, but if you can, or even if you have to take a pause to make this happen, it's okay, right? But like, if you are playing in a game and it's set in, you know, medieval Europe, using more archaic language, just a little bit, right, helps set the tone. If you're playing in a dark dystopia, um, you know, and there's, you know, there's a lot of slang being used or whatever, incorporate that, not just in your character dialogue, but even in the description that you give. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's a it's a way to kind of set that just based on you know your your main tool right which is the words that you use mm-hmm. yeah uh, i i've definitely felt this i'm i'm trying to remember i know that i've like i've really made errors in this one, you know on occasion right it's it's not just that the right word choice can enhance an atmosphere but you know every once in a while the wrong word choice will really like Um, communicate something incorrectly to my players and I can't get it out of their heads or it's really funny Mm -hmm. or like incongruous. Right. Right. Um, And I'm I'm totally blanking on uh, like a specific moment, but I just, this happens in like every campaign at some point, you know, you'll use a a word that makes people think of some cartoon show and now they've got (laughs) that in their head. It's kind of, you know, you know, you'd spent all this time crafting this careful atmosphere. Um, There's a point where sort of, you know, the occasional comedic interlude lets off a little steam and it can be good, but sometimes it can kind of derail that atmosphere. So um, I definitely found this really important. Um, And I I think this is one of the areas that's probably you can gain a lot of information about from like writer's advice, right? We we talked about this in world building, right? All Um, all the connections. I I think like word choice um, is something, is a skill that you can learn a lot about by um, probably reading advice for writers, um, going and reading like books that are kind of the atmosphere that you're looking for. Um, I think there's like this. This is a, a a cool skill that I'm still building. I feel like there's certain genres that I like. I can kind of I have my go to. I can I can nail the word choice for this kind of genre. But for newer ones, right? Like like romance. Like I don't know if I'm like a great romance writer yet. I'm probably gonna read some romance and probably figure out what I hate and what I like and what's working for me before I sort of um, lean into a, a story where I really want to evoke this cool like uh, romantic tension kind of storylines. Right? <laughs> you know that reminds me. So I, I I think that reading a little bit in the genre right before you play is going to help you, mm. and I think that you can you can take that even a step further and say that like uh, what I've had GMs do and 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 I've done a little bit myself is you know if you're playing some swashbuckling adventure game right and you want to get everybody in that frame of mind like 
hop on some cool action scene from, you know, a pirate movie or, or Raiders of the Lost Ark or whatever, and just show them just that scene. Even if everyone's seen that movie 72 yeah. times, it, 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 it just sets the mood in the same way that the right music might set the mood or whatever. Mm. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that there's, there's probably a lot of other things that you can do uh, that way too. Um, but, but I also want to interject here and mm-hmm. say, you know, one of the things that the book talks about is that there are different kinds of game groups and, you know, some game groups are super casual and everyone is there and around the table to just have a good time and make some jokes and eat some Cheetos and, and roll some dice. And in those games, if you are the GM and you're trying really hard to enforce a mood on them, that's just going to be uh, an exercise in frustration. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you think that the players are going to be into it, then take a lot of these uh, tips that we're giving you in this one, in this video. Um, And, and don't be afraid in a, in a, in a gentle way to kind of be the tone enforcer. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, if you're, if your group's going to be receptive to it and, you know, if somebody's making too many weird jokes in the middle of your sort of dark mm-hmm. game or whatever, um, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, you can give them a, a, a sort of a brief kind of reminder, you know, remember, we're, you know, this is a dark game or whatever, but also just the way you present things mm. will set the tone and maybe make it so that you don't even have to make those kind of adjustments, right? Like, if you're playing some dark game um, that's, you know, dark dystopian future, totalitarian government kind of thing, right? If you yourself kind of are running the game that way a little bit, right? I mean, everything in moderation. Um, it's going to set the tone, right? Everyone's going to feel a little cowed in the, in the way that their characters probably feel a little cowed by the, by the system, right? Mm-hmm. So we can think about the way that our word choices and um, our setting of the atmosphere can 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 lend to this sort of mood, um, but you know your your body is a big part of the dynamicism that you can bring to a game, yes. and so I think there's a, a lot of ways that you can can tune this right acting is a whole beautiful field full of subfields that will tell you all the different ways that you can communicate with your body and your voice and um, and things you do and don't do with that, right? Um, but a couple of things that I think, you know, have been really transformative and places that I like to explore is is a lot about like kind of um, – your the way you hold your body and and your movement of it i think so um i i find i get a lot of mileage out of whether am i sitting down or am i standing up right i think that alone can can start to really change how the players are responding to me change you know uh like the 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 atmosphere at the table a little bit um you know and uh especially like you know, are you looming over them? Are you are you stepping back and giving them lots of space? Um, I think like even before you get into sort of movement, how are you holding yourself? And I think that's definitely like worth thinking about when you're trying to create these um, powerful moods at the table. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, sometimes, you know, if it's an action scene, if you are sort of more animated and active and and you know, assuming that the space and 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 you know you're you uh, can do so right, getting up from the table, moving around a little bit, right? Maybe even doing some sort of light, you know, like he raises his sword above his head, kind of stuff, just makes it sort of more dynamic and whatnot. And of course, you know, voices and and the use of your voice. Now, not everybody is a master of voices and accents or whatnot. But you can just do a lot, anybody can just do a lot with, you know, like how fast you talk, right? If you're, if you're portraying an NPC who's frantic and he's talking really fast and he's really excited, right? Anybody can do that. Mm-hmm. You, know, um, you could also modulate your voice and talk really slowly and, and suddenly seem much more contemplative and, and that kind of thing. Or you can speak louder, softly. Um, you know, you don't have to be you know, one of those people that can do do impressions and whatnot in order to do a lot with your voice. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially for GMs who might have been playing with voices for for a long time. um, You know, there's, 
there's lots of cool like voice acting techniques and, and things that you can probably go read up on. Um, I'm sure there's lots of resources to like go pretty deep into voice, you know, voice stuff if you would like to at your table. Um, but I, I think sort of a, a step beyond the GMing 101 trying out voices has been like realizing, you know, purposefully going against um, expectations about what someone's voice should be like, right? And so I think one of the um, one of the creepiest times that I remember like being really shook by a voice recently was uh, when you, Monty, were portraying Bode. So this is in the Invisible Sun campaign, The Raven Wants What You Have. We've gone down to the, you know, the undersling, this like really gross, horrible, dangerous, violent, awful place. And we're in this really gross, dangerous, horrible, awful, violent bar. <laughs> and its owner is expected to be, you know, you know, I, I think I came in with these expectations that it would be loud and boisterous and violent and dangerous and Bode was you know soft spoken kind of slow quiet and uh that that ju- that um mismatch of expectation really i could, you could tell that everyone at the table was like oh we don't know what we're dealing with here and so that was i think a really effective way that we were sort of set on edge is by that um, you know, you had portrayed a bunch of NPCs who are big and in your face and Bode was not. And now we were not sure what we were dealing with anymore. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a really good point. And, um, you know, uh, avoiding cliches, I mean, cliches are cliches for a reason and you don't want to just issue them all, but like, uh, going against type sometimes can be really useful, but, I'm going to say that like we all have tells, right? Like we talk about that in poker, but we all have the little things that we do. And the more you're aware of them, the more that you can actually use them on a metagame level. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So uh, I ran this campaign uh, in college. It was a fantasy campaign. And, you know, the sort of typical thing where as the characters got more powerful, they got more stuff. And so when they would see NPCs and they had more stuff, Mm. uh, they also knew that the NPCs were more powerful, right? I've got a staff with a, you know, and it's glowing and it's throwing out energy and a sword that talks and, right, oh, this guy must be a badass, right? Right. And so um, learning that that was the information that I was inadvertently conveying to the players, um, you know, I would have like, you know, they're down in this deep, dark dungeon on level 17, you know, and, they, <laughs> and then there's a guy just standing there and he's just wearing a shirt and pants, right? Yeah. And, and, and knowing like how the world worked, right? They knew, oh, this guy must be so powerful, right? We, I, I can, by, by just having this guy look like a normal person just with clothing, it conveyed exactly the opposite of what you would expect, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, but, but that was only because I had learned the, what the player's expectations were from the things that I did. And, and, and every GM has that, right? We all, you know, kind of have these default things that we go to that we stick into our adventures and whatnot. But if you know those things, you can then use them either to play against type, set up expectations, you know, to deliver on expectations. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really worth, uh, reflecting on. I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, that in sort of maybe our, our next episode, but, um, that, that, learning your tells is, is actually kind of hard work, right? You know, sometimes your players will give you a break and they'll, they'll make a joke. And often I'll learn that I have a tell that way, right? Like, oh, something's, you know, Darcy's invoked a beetle. There's something cool right. and weird behind it because Darcy loves beetles or whatever, right? Um, so that's a little bit me. Um, uh, you know, in, in game, you know, they would they would draw these connections of oh you know the NPCs of this weird these weird cultists why they're you know they've always got you know some weird animal following around them right and so that's how we can tell and you know I didn't plan that but now that I know that they've made an erroneous pattern I can I can break that I can lean into it and say heck yeah now I know how to communicate suddenly right. like who might be one of these weird cultists that have animals around them all the time right. Uh, so sometimes your players will give you that inadvertently. Um, I think that's really helpful when you have a co-GM who might be able to point it out to you. 
right? Right. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of this comes down to, again, the, the words that we're using when we're communicating. And, and that's never more true than when the GM is providing description. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing to keep in mind as a, as a beginning GM, as an advanced GM, is that if you describe something, the players are going to be interested in it, right? right? So if they're walking down the street and you give a little bit more description to this woman who is coming out of the bank, they're going to assume, oh, there's something going on with her, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and maybe you want to use that. Maybe you don't, but you don't want to do it accidentally, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, one of the things that I always think about when it comes to this is, as the GM, specificity is not your friend. And mm -hmm. here's what I mean by that. Uh, uh, you know, you go into uh, the, you know, the, the great example is in uh, the old module, uh, to Temple of Elemental Evil, where there's like, you know, the box text that you're supposed to read, and it literally will say things like, okay, this is a storeroom, then there are 17 crates and 54 barrels, and, right? and, and, and you know, of course, when I'm thinking, well, how on earth, as the player, how on earth do I know that? Did I count them? Right. That's not the way that, that we sort of interact with the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, what I will try to do is I will try to give as, as accurate and vivid a description as I can. And if the players want more information, um, that means that like, like if I say, okay, there's six soldiers come or at you, that's one thing. But if I say there's a group of soldiers, there's a mm -hmm. bunch of, of armed men coming toward you, that is going to conjure up different images in different people's minds, but that's okay, right? And if yeah. somebody says, well, how many of them are there? That means, that that's another way of the player saying, I'm going to stop and count how mm -hmm. many there are and assess the situation, you know? But if somebody else just says, well, I run, then then they're not, right? And and so sometimes asking those kinds of questions is actually a statement of, of action right. and that's okay, right? We wanna, that that's the conversation that we wanna be having, right? Yeah, that's such a good point. Um, something I think a lot about too is that, uh, you know, I'm role playing a character who knows a lot more about their world than I, Darcy, do, right? So um, part of what you want to convey as a GM, you know, you want to convey like that character's assessment of something too, right? Like right. is if I say it's a it's a handful of soldiers versus it's a whole bunch of soldiers, you know, or like a horde of soldiers, right? Um, I'm kind of communicating a, a handful might be, it's both, it both might be referring to number, but it's also referring to how tough are they, right? Am I intimidated by them? Would, would, should your character be wary of this situation, right? Right. So, um, and like, you don't always want to have to say your character would know X, right? Uh, and you always right. you don't always want to have to make your players ask. Well, would my character be intimidated? You know, you can use the the language you're using to sort of communicate a little bit about that, right? About how um, how that that how what they are seeing would be kind of interpreted by their own abilities and their backgrounds and what they know about the world. That is a fantastic point, right? There's a difference between saying there's a formidable number of soldiers, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there's like you said, a handful that that conveys information in a really interesting way. I find that really fascinating. Um, you know, and like, and I like, I like to use people's imaginations kind of, uh, I won't say against them, but, but mm -hmm. to my advantage as the GM, right? And so like one of my favorite go-tos was uh, something I did in a horror campaign where I described a monster as having too many legs. Yes. Right? And that means something different to everybody, right? Um, in, a, in a way that like saying it has six legs is just kind of uh, okay, right? right. Um, but, but, but too many legs implies, it, it, it's kind of like a formidable number of soldiers, right? It, mm -hmm. it implies a wrongness, right? Yeah. Like however many times I count them, it's, it's, it's too many, right? Yeah. Um, so the language choices, I think, are, are really, are really interesting and fun. And 
here's the other thing that is very similar to that too. And that is sometimes as the GM, you'll say, okay, you see uh, out of the corner of your eye, a dark, a dark shape kind of moving in the woods, right? And the players are immediately going to say, oh, is it a person? Is it a bear, right? They're going to ask you all these questions. You're not, as the GM, beholden to answer those questions, mm -hmm. right? They're going to they're gonna be like really demanding and insistent, you know, what, but, but, you know, just think about, you know, the last time you were sort of in a, in a dark street or a dark woods or, or, you know, like you don't, you know, you, in the real world, you aren't able to identify everything and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And so it's totally legitimate to say, you don't know, right. How are, or, or, or my favorite is how are you going to go about finding out? Right. right. Turn it to action. Give it, put, put the, Right. You know, what does your character do? <laughs> Let's get your character doing things again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I am, am still trying to walk the right line on um, as a GM. So it is about handling emotion in my descriptions of things, right? Because, you know, sometimes I want the outcome of, ooh, you see a spooky thing. But it's, you know, it's never quite right to tell a character, hello you know, a player, your character feels scared at X, right? Right. You don't want to dictate what someone's, what a character's emotional response will be because that's, that's part of the fun of role playing, right? Um, too many legs still works because it's sort of conventionally too many legs and your wizard might love too many legs. It's still a wrongness. <laughs> it's a wrongness that they might be excited by. Um, but, you know, it still gives a lot of uh, sort of how do I, the role player want to react to this information, it still leaves that a lot in their hands. So how do you, how do you walk that line between trying to give players enough information that like certain things would be formidable to their character, but you don't want to, but not telling them you are scared by this, you are intimidated, right? Right. That is a really tricky thing. Um, I think that again, since we're talking advanced GMing mm -hmm. here, I think that sometimes you can inject emotion mm -hmm. into descriptions, right? Like if I was, if I was running a game that was like Lord of the Rings movies and the player characters are in Helm's Deep and there's a million orcs coming and, and, and suddenly, you know, Gandalf and the writers of Rohan come over the top of that hill. I am tempted to talk about, you know, you know, your breath kind of catches in yeah. your chest as you see coming over the hill, you know, something that is going to, you know, save all of your lives um, and, 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 and convey that because here's why I think that's legit. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think you want to, like you said, I think you're hundred percent right. You don't want to dictate emotions, but sometimes emotions come upon us. Right. Right. That, that, that we're not necessarily in control of. And, and those are the moments when I think the GM can kind of, you know, say, um, you know, it, I mean, it's not wrong, for example, to say you're surprised when right. the door flies open and, you yeah. know, Bigfoot comes through or whatever. Right. Um, and, and in that same way, you know, it, you can talk about things in terms of like, you know, uh, maybe even something like despite yourself, you know, yeah. the feeling of relief comes over you as, you know, the monster runs away or whatever it is, right? Yeah, I think you're totally right. And I think a lot of knowing what your players will feel good about is, is, a bit, is you know, having played with them for a while, being a pretty advanced GM who knows what those players are comfortable uh, sort of, you know, I feel like sometimes I have players and I'm like, I know that they always want to dictate their own emotions or that, you know, they're playing the weird character. So maybe I'll let everybody else say, you know, oh gosh, you have this breath of relief. And I'll, I'll like not, I'll sort of pointedly, you know, say about, say that about the group and let the character be um, different if they need to be right. So knowing your players is really helpful here. Um, but man, it's so powerful when you're in some of these, like when you're describing like I, I know I've had uh, players really enjoy it when I um, do dictate a little bit of that emotions washing over them, especially when it comes to like like deep friendships or romance or like your mentor comes back and like you know you know 
this, this character's eyes just widen in shock, right? Like, oh, the, the long awaited thing. I know players have really enjoyed that because it's, it's, if I'm doing it right, it's me validating their character choices. It's me yes. validating all the emotional work that's maybe come before. So um, when it works, oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's, right. it's sort of a, it's easy to um, screw up in the beginning if you're just sort of dictating people's emotions. So uh, definitely not a one-on-one trick. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I think that's exactly right. Knowing your players, because because if you, like you said, you do it right, you're validating them. Like in, in mm-hmm. the campaign that I'm running right now, one player, she's really into food, right? She actually owns and runs a, a, her own bakery and whatnot. And so if, uh, I, would, I would feel perfectly comfortable saying to her character, or, you know, to her, you are delighted by the... Yeah you know, wonderful spread that the, the, you know, NPC puts in front of you. Um, and, but, but like you said, I'm, I'm validating her choices, Mm -hmm. right? I'm I'm saying you have done such a great job of playing your character that I know Mm -hmm. you will be delighted at how delicious all this stuff is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another piece of this that, you know, as we're talking about techniques that you use to sort of, uh, curate this, Um, kind of tone and mood and and the whole game experience. Um, You know, we've talked a lot about what you can do at the table, (laughs) Uh, your voice, your body language, the words you use, um, the lights. But uh, I I think a huge piece of this is also listening, right? Um, Listening to what other players are saying at the table, keying off of them, right? Um, There is no being dynamic if you're not um, thinking about this conversation, what's happening between us. Uh, What do you like to think about, and you know, as sort of an advanced GM, what are the things you're keeping an eye out for, um, you know, with like how your GMing style is being uh, reacted to? One of the things that you can do is you can listen to how the players interact with each other, Mm -hmm. right? And, And suddenly you will get an insight that you can then use when you have an NPC come and interact with it, with it, mm-hmm. right? If 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 there's two uh, and if there's two PCs like I happen to have in my current campaign where that used to be in a band together, right? And so they would they occasionally talk music with each other, right? Then that allows me that gives me an in, right? Yeah. If I wanted to have an NPC come in and endear themselves, right? I could have them talk about music or whatever um i mean that's a that's a very simplistic example but it's one it's a way in which i'm listening to what players are saying not even necessarily talking to me that i can then make use of in the game right and and again it kind of goes back to what we were saying just a minute ago where i'm i'm then validating Mm -hmm. their portrayal of the character right because they uh you know i i heard them right? right and really i mean you know we're in a conversation, and so everyone's goal it is to communicate, right? To be heard. Mm. Yeah. I I think I feel like I can point to like a moment where I felt like I leveled up as a GM, and like it's it is it is recorded on camera. Like I can show you the footage <laughs> of the moment where I was where I I leveled up as a GM, and that was um, when I was uh, jamming Invisible Sun for s- some improvisers, right? Um, and I, I jammed for improvisers before, and I feel like every time I do, I learn I learn some new things because oh my goodness, it's just a, a different background of storytelling, and so they're, you know, it's it's a different field of storytelling, and so it's always a little surprising to me in fun ways. But it was when you know we were a couple sessions in, and uh, you know, I realized that um, there was some really beautiful role playing that was happening at the table between characters that. I was not giving enough space for. I was kind of, if there was a lull in conversation, I was interjecting myself as a GM to, you know, pick up the pace, make more cool narrative happen, bring in a cool NPC. Wow. You know, what do you do? How do you feel about this? Blah. And uh, I, I realized that um, like the use of silence as, as a GM yeah. can be extremely powerful. It is another tool in your toolkit, like asking questions or narrating or body language is stepping back um, and knowing when to, right? And I, I think there's a lot of context that goes into that, but I really encourage, you know, as an experiment in your next game, like see what happens when you play with not 
not speaking up quite as fast as you often do or taking, um, you know, let, let a silence linger for a minute and see what comes up in it, right? Are the players rising to that silence? Is everyone just really uncomfortable? <laughs> that can be useful in a horror game, right? Um, right? Start to learn what silence does to your table and your game. And I think then you can really use it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's really smart. Um, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes you can listen to what a player says in character, but you can also listen to what they're saying, not in character when, Mm -hmm. you know, if, uh, and this is just sort of like going back to things we've talked about before, like being in tune with your players, making sure they're having a good time. You know, if, if, if somebody is saying, well, okay, I'm gonna, I guess I'll attack. Yeah. That they're actually saying a lot there, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're kind of bored. They're feeling frustrated. They really want this combat to be over. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so, you know, those sorts of kinds of listening exercises, I think, um, or, or, or experiences, um, can can really add a lot to your skill um, and 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 portraying a game as you want, right? Picking up on cues, I guess, yeah. is really what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, we, we've talked about this before, but you know, even even with people I know pretty well, sometimes like communication is hard. Communi- we are humans. Communicating is like what we do, and it's still hard. Okay, <laughs> like uh, there, you know. Communication is a um, just a really deep field that has a, it can have a lot of really confusing signals in it, right? And so I think sometimes I can immediately read a situation and I totally understand, okay, that person's frustrated and wants the combat over. I know what to do. Um, sometimes I'm, you know, even with a group I know, even in a situation that I think I should know, I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I can, I can read the signal that something is off. And uh, just like with the good use of silence, uh, you, you know, you, taking five, like take five in the middle of the combat, you know, give yourself the opportunity to course correct, to find out, to uh, give yourself a few more neurons to, to um, identify, given all your jamming experience, what is really going on and what will fix it. Right. Yeah. I think, I think that's really true. You can also listen to, to the players and, and pick up on, on the kinds of things that they are talking about, Mm -hmm. um, people can, you know, people sort of reveal, uh, you know, what they want without being overt, just Mm -hmm. in the kinds of things that they keep saying. And I don't just mean like whether they look bored or, or they're engaged or whatever, but I mean, like, uh, uh, if, if a player is always, talking about their uh you know their animal companion right and they're they're constantly you know listen to that right because Mm -hmm. they are showing you how important that animal companion is right they're 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 dire wolf or whatever it is that that they have and and then and then use that like like i don't mean like do something terrible to the wolf i mean uh almost the opposite right like lay up right? Mm-hmm. Clearly that's important to them. Set up situations where having that dire wolf companion is, is key to the situation, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or, you know, is important. Or, you know, if you want to have an NPC love them, you know, have them compliment their dire wolf or, you know, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it's just a, it's, it, you know, we, we talked in the previous video about having the players kind of provide hooks and whatnot for you, but sometimes they're going to do that without you asking them to and without being overt about it. And you're only going to find that through just paying attention. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. I think that has to be it for this episode, even though I think we have a lot more specifics <laughs> to get into on all of this. Um, we would love to hear what you have to say about some of these topics, about being a dynamic GM, about um, responding and understanding what's being communicated to you from your players. Um, I bet there's a lot of stories about, you know, times where uh, you've really gotten it right or lessons you've learned. So please share those with us down below in the comments or with the hashtag your best game ever on social media. I would love yeah, what's, to hear the story. What's, 
Yeah. What's your, what's your favorite prop that, that someone, or maybe you have made and interjected into a game, right? Or whatever that we would love to hear that. Uh, pictures, pictures, please. <laughs> uh, so excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have one more video on sort of a, a hodgepodge of your, advanced jamming techniques and of course as we opened up this little this little series within a series with how to set up your game we're going to talk about um you know processing after your games and and uh, techniques you can bring to bear to sort of improve even further as a jam um sort of after the session has come to a close so get ready for our next video and um you can of course find all advice like this and much more in your best game ever just go to yourbestgameever.com Thank you, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye.